everyone, welcome back to my channel, True Crime with Jess Rose. Well, this is my 100th story. Can you believe it? This is going to be my 100th story and I've reached 400 subscribers today. So I just want to thank you all so much. I know there actually are people out there that have watched all my stories um, and I really appreciate it. I re appreciate anyone who's commented, um, liked, subscribed. You know, I, I, honestly, I really, I really, really do appreciate it. Um, and today, uh, from, from the 100th story, um, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, if you watched my Jonathan Edward Jones story, um, I think it's about 10 stories ago, um, it was a little bit different, and that's similar to the one I'm going to do today um now <coughs> I don't know how it works I have mentioned before I don't know how it works when mentioning other YouTube creators but this one I, I first heard from this YouTuber and to be honest if you enjoy true crime which if you're here obviously you do um this guy is absolutely fantastic and I would definitely recommend him. His name's, uh, the channel's called Mr. Borland. Um, he was a Navy SEAL. He's, he's now does these YouTube stories and he's just the, the greatest storyteller I've ever watched. Um, and my personal favourite, he does, uh, standalone, uh, stories much like myself, but he also does um uh stories where he does three uh stories in one video and they're called top three so we'll do top three places that people go that they shouldn't top three photos with disturbing backstories top three videos with disturbing backstories honestly he's fantastic um i discovered him last year and he's blown up i mean when i started watching him i think he was under a million subscribers and now he's sitting at the last time I seen, which was actually yesterday, he was at 5,350,000. He's really blown up in the past year. Um, and this is one of the stories I'd actually heard about months and months and months ago. But it stayed. And I kept on looking at other videos or, you know went online to research the case and to learn a bit more about the the two gentlemen I'm about to talk about. Um, and I just really wanted to share it with you. Like I say, it's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, if you watch my Jonathan Edward Jones story, you'll get the drift of where I'm going with this. Um, and as the title says, it's the Dion Dreyer David Shaw story. And it's, uh, yeah, the horrifying story of Bushman's Hole. Okay. So, DeAndrea, um, good-looking boy. Uh, I haven't seen too many pictures of him or too much about his early, early years. Um, but what I do know is his parents were Marie and Theo Dreyer. Um, and he was from... Very, oh, I'm sorry for my pronunciation. I'm sorry to everyone in South Africa because I know I'm going to butcher some of these words and all I can do is apologise. Uh, Vereen Igging. Vereen Igging in South Africa. I'm sorry. Um, but that's where he was from. And Dean, he just, he was a really adventurous boy. He was really spunky and he you know he loved designing apparently very loud car stereos he loved motorcycling um he was just a really adventurous lad um and then when he got to sort of the 18 19 uh age periods in his life um cave diving uh started to appeal to him and he absolutely loved it and over the next two years, he actually clocked up look, 200 dives, it said, around 200. So in Christmas 1994, so we're going back, um, Dion, who was 20 by this point, 
he was so excited because he was invited to um, do a, a cave dive with the South African Cave Diving Association. So it's some divers from there. Um, and he was just over the moon because the dive was at Bushman's Hole. Okay. So Dion's thrilled. Um, and apparently just before he was due to go, look, sort of the week before, I believe, um, there was a family barbecue. And, you know, it, Dion's dad, Theo, said that Dion had stated that if he had a choice of how to go in life, um, he'd like to go out diving. So meaning, like, you know, if, if, if he had a choice in the matter, that's where he would go. Um, now, Bushman's Hole, the it's actually called, again, I'm sorry, it's Bozeman's Gap. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but... Because of that, it's called Bushman's Hole, nicknamed Bushman's Hole. Um, now, it's a, a huge crater. Now, when you try and image this crater, because it's on um, a pri private farmland, and it's hundreds of feet wide. So in my brain, if you've ever seen the film Wolf Creek, and there's a crater that they visit there in Australia, um... And they saw a uh, this hill that takes them three hours to climb, and then they reach the top, and there's just this amazing crater that I think a meteor had hit thousands of years ago or something. Anyway, that's what this reminded me of in, in you know when you take a mental image, um, and you've got this crater hundreds of feet wide. So if you, but if you do the the hike down this crater. You come to kind of um, a kind of a puddle of water, bigger bigger than a puddle, but you know, just this small amount of water in the middle of this crater, and that's actually the entrance to Bushman's Hole. Okay, now what you have to do is you go into this little kind of puddle's probably not the right word, but into this area of water, um, and it's a very tight claustrophobic push into what is Bushman's Hole and it opens up into the biggest freshwater cave in the world but when I mention the John Edward Jones story don't forget he was caving um, and it was you know deep in the graves hundreds of feet down it was you know, obviously very tight, and if you've watched the story, obviously, you know what happened. Um, now, imagine that with water added to that, and that's what this is. You're, you're, you're diving, um, and the depth of, of Bushman's Hole is it's about 900 feet, and I've got I've, I've had to look on different um sites and stuff and the closest i've got is 928 feet which is 283 meters down okay it sounds horrific it sounds awful to someone like me i'm just like absolutely not i don't like swimming in the kids pool you know in a swimming bath i don't like it i don't like water over my head so the thought of this just sounds awful. It's my worst nightmare. But obviously there's hundreds and thousands of people out there where it's, you know, like I say, adrenaline junkies, where it's, the, it's their idea of just amazing. It said it's like space walking when you go into, once you push through, it opens out, like I say, it's this huge cave. Um, and yeah, they say it's like space walking and you just go down. You know, and that that's what you do. And obviously, you get people who want to beat records and so you can go the deepest and, you know, maybe discover different caves within there. You know, it, it's just, it just puts the shivers at me. But like I say, it, it, you know, for some people, this is just amazing. Okay, so... 
the group that Dion went with were planning a descent of 493 feet, which is 150 metres, so basically about halfway down Bushman's Hole. Um, and the dive was going really well. Um, and a diver that was in front of Dion, so I believe on the ascent, so you're going back up, um, it was all going well, but it, I believe Dion was the last to go up. Um, so he was in the last in the in the group, and the driver in front of him said at one point he looked back. Dion was fine. They'd done kind of. I think this is the sign, or you know, to say they're okay. Um, everything was fine. But that same driver, when he looked back, probably about thirty meters later, um, so about hundred feet later, um, all he could see was Dion's. Uh, a torch uh, just sinking just sinking down obviously Dion's attached to that but it's so dark you know I've watched so many cave diving you know footage and it's so dark in there it's pitch black um, and all you've got is this torch so when you're looking down nine times out of ten all you're going to see is someone's torch and he could see that sinking and this diver obviously Dion's 20 years old. He's he's so young. He's got everything to live for. And this diver just tried to go down after him. But Dion was sinking so quickly. So quickly. And this diver was very aware that Bushman's Hole went on for, you know, more than double what they'd already just done. Um, and it would have been suicide to go after him. So... He couldn't follow him, um, and it was, Dion's parents were told he possibly had a deep water blackout, um, and, 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 yeah, I, they, they were just devastated, I mean, imagine your son's, you know, gone off, he, he you know, he was only supposed to be gone for the day, he was going on this huge adventure, and you're just told, not only that, when they sent, they sent like a robot down to the bottom of Bushman's Hole because it is a very, very dangerous place, the deeper you go. Um, and they couldn't find him. They, they, so they couldn't retrieve his body so his parents could give him a burial. And I just can't imagine that, you know, it'd be devastating enough to hear that news over your Christmas holidays and then to be told, we can't find him. They can't bury him. You know, so Marie and Theo are obviously devastated. Um, and the most they could do, like John Edward Jones, they put a plaque up um, simply with Dion's name. Um, and obviously he was born 7th of August 74 and he died Christmas 94. I, I can't think of the exact date, but it was Christmas 94. Um, oh, and I just can't imagine it. And obviously divers who went in, because they didn't close the, the cave, you know. It, it continued to be this adventure for other divers. Um, but every time they would get to Bushman's Hole, you know, there it was, Dion's plaque, and it was a reminder. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of divers would have loved to have found Dion for his family. I'm so sorry about this noise. It's not me. It's outside somewhere. I've closed windows. I've closed doors. I don't know what they're doing. So I do apologise, but I'm just going to speak louder. Um, so... Ten years later, ten years, poor family, um, there's a gentleman called Dave Shaw. Now, Dave Shaw was born on the 20th of July in 1954 uh, in Australia. Um, and Dave was an airline pilot for the Cathay Pacific airline. Um, now, Dave was a scuba diver and also a very advanced technical diver. You know, he went 
to 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 depth to depth that people hadn't gone before is that the right wording I, I I don't know the technical terms for these, and I'm so sorry. I've tried to get a lot of them, but cave divers out there, please don't come for me. Please don't. Um, but yeah, he he was just he was a really advanced diver, um, and he he uh, dove in caves all around the world. Um, so on the 28th of October 2004. Dave actually broke records within Bushman's Hole and he, do he broke records for depth on a rebreather. A rebreather, I believe, is rather than using um, oxygen tanks, you're rebreathing your own breath, but it can only be used to a certain depth, I believe. Um, Depth in a cave on a rebreather. That was another record he broke. Depth at altitude on a rebreather. And depth running a line. Now, the line is what a lot of divers use when they first go, go to a certain depth. So other people can follow in time and so they can find their way back. Because um, like I say, it's pitch black. You know, you lose your torch and... If you haven't got a line to follow, you're in real trouble. But the most amazing thing about this record was that while Dave was down at this depth, and I believe it was the 800 foot depth, maybe nine, or if you bear with me, um, but he discovered Dion, robot hadn't discovered that had been sent down you know like the the water robots um or the divers don't obviously hadn't been that that deep anyway so he found him and he said that when he got to the bottom of bushman's hole about i think it was 30 foot away he could see something in the water and as he got nearer he just knew who it was. Everyone was aware of Dion. Because although it's so dangerous, and I've 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 looked at an awful lot of cave diving stories, and it's it a lot of caves have very tragic stories behind them of people who don't make it out. But it's very, very rare for their bodies not to be recovered so the families can bury their loved ones you know so the rest in peace and so it's very very rare and plus he was such a young boy you know he's just starting his life out um you know so dave was just over the moon he didn't care about these records he'd just broken he found dion um and when he went over it's been 10 years okay um Dion didn't have his helmet on anymore. That had been found years earlier. Um, so obviously it was Dion's skull and his hands were skeletal. But the rest of him was in, obviously, in the wet suit. Um, and when Dave went over to try and move him, because the minute he'd seen him, he wanted to bring him back with him, um, he couldn't move him. And what had happened was is Dion's... Um, equipment had become encased in the mud now no one knows did he get caught in the mud is that what happened was it a deep water blackout no one knows what exactly what went wrong with Dion but over the years this is what had happened and Dave just couldn't move him at that time and Dave was starting to run out of air because like I could say he's he's at great depth and he already knows he's got to stop at decompression, decompression so it's on the way back up um you know so he knows he's, he's gotta go so Dion when Dave got to the top he, and they worked it out Dion was at 890 feet so he's at 270 meters because the bottom of Bushman's hole actually goes on a slant so it does go down to 900 feet but Dion was kind of here 
Um, so what David done, he tied a line to Dion. So obviously they could find him again. And Dave made his way up. And he just wanted to get back down as soon as possible to get Dion. But he knew because Dion was stuck, you know, it was going to take some preparation for and, you know, finding out know, uh, how it was safe to move him, and, you know, etc. So the first thing Dave did, done when he got out of Bushman's Hole, he contacted the authorities and he also contacted Marie and Theo. And he just basically said, I'm going to get your son back. Because he felt kind of a connection with Theo when he'd been down there. Um, and he was just so focused on getting this boy back to his family. You know, so on January the 8th, 2005. So it took, you know, a few months to get everything in place to make sure this was safe. And they were able to get Dion out you know, as safe as possible without putting anyone else in danger. Um, so there was actually a team that was put together um, to, to do this rescue. No, not rescue. Oh, it's not a rescue, is it? To do this mission. Um, is it a rescue? Body rescue? Oh, God. I don't want to say anything um, insensitive. But there was a team put together. Um... Now, what was how it was worked out? Although the dive itself, for Dave to get to the bottom, only takes seventeen minutes. Only, uh, you know, I suppose when you think about that, seventeen minutes is a long time. But when Dave comes back up, it would take twelve hours to come back up to stop at each decompression. So. It, and the reason for this, um, it's to stop a thing called decompression sickness, which is uh, known in the diving community as the bends. Um, and it's just when a diver ascends too quickly, so they come back up too quickly. Um, and it can be very, very dangerous um, to a diver. So what the plan was, was Dave was going to descend down to the 890 feet. Um, his wife had actually made a silk body bag to put Dion in just so we could bring him back as intact as possible. Um, I keep on having to emphasise it has been 10 years. Um, so his wife had got this silk body bag ready. Obviously, he couldn't go down with a, a heavy, you know. So... What was going to happen is Dave was going to descend to 890 feet. He was going to obviously get Dion, uh, you know, loosen him from where his, his, his equipment had kept him stuck, get him in the body bag. Um, and as Dave was ascending, 13 minutes after, so four minutes before Dave would have hit the bottom, Another diver would come down. Now, he would stop um, 30 metres, so 100 feet above Dave. Another diver would come down, again, stop at the 30 metre mark, so 100 feet above that diver, and so on and so forth all the way up. And the plan was that when Dave had got Dion, he would ascend to... The first, the diver nearest him, give Dion to that diver. He would then wait there so his body can acclimate to where he was in the water. That diver would go up 100 feet, the 30 metres to the next diver, pass Dion on, that diver would then wait, and so on and so forth. So, um, in the Mr. Borland story, he describes it as a, like a relay race, which, you know, made sense to me. Um, so that was the plan. Now, Dave also um, had like a GoPro, like a camera attached to his helmet. So they're all ready. They're all ready to go. And Dave begins his dive. 
Now, just after Dave went into the water, Marie and Theo, who'd been waiting a little bit further away from the crater, because um, they didn't want to add any pressure to Dave. It was obviously a very highly pressured situation anyway. It's a very dangerous mission. Um, so they then came down to the edge of uh, the cave and um, David made his descent and now the second diver makes his descent. Now, when the second dive, when Dave, sorry, when Dave got to the bottom, he very quickly, you know, started uh, putting the, trying to get the body bag on to Dion and etc. No, 13 minutes later, like I say, that second diver has now reached that 100 foot mark uh, above where Dave is. And he said, he looked, because at this point, he would have kind of been expecting maybe some movement that he could see, maybe Dave was on his way up. I mean, Dave had reached the bottom earlier than planned of the 17 minutes. But all he could see was Dave's torch, like the light, let's say. And that light wasn't moving. And he, he said he kept looking to see if it was him. Because, you know, your mind can play tricks on you at that depth. And he was thinking, is it me? What's going on? Now, when he realised that Dave's torch wasn't moving, the light wasn't moving, he just... You know, much like the diver who was in front of Dion, you know, it was an automatic, I've got to get down there to help. It was automatic, um, you know, and he didn't think twice either. But as he started to descend, he heard like a fizzling sound and it was his gauge. And that gauge was to tell him this particular diver, which they all had, you know, when they're going to run out of air and... You know, I presume it gives them certain information. And it fizzled and it broke. And as he was descending, he knew, he knew this was going to be a mistake if he, you know, if he went much further. Um, so he went back to the decompression site. He, he keeps looking at the torch. Time's going by. And he knows, he knows, Dave's not coming back. And that's exactly what he wrote in his, like, a grease pen and a slate that all divers given when they're going at depth. And he ha had to make the journey up to the next decompression compression site where there was a diver waiting. The diver who was waiting was obviously expecting this diver to be passing Dion on. And instead, and I have seen the footage, it was, like I said, the slate with Dave not coming back. There was something else written underneath that no matter how close I tried to get, I don't know if it was my eyes, I couldn't quite read it. But, it, you know, we know that you could see quite clearly. And slowly that diver had to bring the slate up to the next diver to show them and so on and so forth. And by the time they all got to the surface, um, obviously Dion's parents were there. So not only are they devastated that they're just not going to get their son back, they now have an added guilt, which it, it wasn't theirs to, to, it wasn't their burden. You know, Dave did this, you know, he wanted to do this. This is something he wanted to do, but you would have that guilt nonetheless. And they had that as well, that Dave was also gone. And it was said that they all just sat there for for, for in silence for like a, a very long time. No one spoke and no one knew what to say. No one knew what had gone wrong. Um, and it was just devastating. Um, and they, they, Dave had actually said, I believe that if something did happen to him down there, to leave him. I believe that's what was said. 
And because of the depth and how dangerous it was, a decision was made that, yes, you know, Dion and Dave will remain at the bottom of Bushman's Hole. Um, so a couple of days later, no one had the heart to, to start getting their gear out of the, the, the water there and then, so everyone left. Um, and I believe it was a couple of days later that they came back to get all their gear and, you know, collect the lines that were in the water, etc. Um, but as they're pulling up their lines, there's kind of like a, a, a bubbling in the water um, on the surface. And they realised that Dave was attached to that line. Not only was Dave attached, but Dion as well and they both had had floated up to the surface and they were both able to be retrieved oh god um you know it's for their families for marie and theo it's just a mate but it's just the it's just the saddest saddest thing when they brought dave up don't remember I said he had a camera on his helmet and his helmet was still attached obviously to him. Um, so they all sat down and to watch the footage and the camera played everything right to the end. Um, and you can see this online. It's very, um, obviously it's dark as you can imagine. And what was worked out had happened when Dave got down to the bottom of Bushman's Hole, the 893 feet. Um, Dion wasn't um, stuck anymore. Whatever had happened during that, whether it was the line that he'd attached to Dion at the time, um, but Dion was now floating. Um, and that, were, you know, it would have shot Dave because it would it's gonna it would have made it very very difficult for dave to get dion who was now floating in this water into the body bag that had been made so he could bring him up now don't forget although dion's head and hands were skeletal they weren't sure of what body mass was left in his wet suit um and it was said that it was, it's called, um, please bear with me, it's called adiposia, adiposia, and it means that his body had become almost soap like in his wet suit, which caused him to float, which is what made it very difficult for Dave. So, what Dave had done, he put his, his, his lamp or his, his, his torch on the on the ground so we could use both of his hands to try and get Dion into the into the bag um and whilst doing this the the torch the, the the wire to the torch is attached to his arm so whilst doing this this movement he's got himself wrapped up so not only is he wrapped up in this wire in lo, lo, this line he's sort of also become attached to Dion's line and on the footage, you see kind of a panic overtake Dave, even though he was, um, like I say, he was trained in this and he was, you know, he he dived to mega depths, you know, many, many times. But it was, it goes to show that at that depth, it can happen to anyone. You become very confused. And it was said that he succumbed to something that's called no nitrogen narcosis. And it, ha it can happen to divers at depths below 130 feet, which is like 40 metres. Um, and it's nitrogen narcosis, it's, it's likened to having a lot of alcohol. A lot of alcohol. Um, and you become confused. You, you you don't function very well down there and it said that this had started to overtake Dave while he was down there and no matter how experienced you are a diver you it, it, what, what I've read on it you can try and 
bring your mind round, but you can't. You can't because it's overtaking your mind and you become confused. And what you see on the footage is Dave turn and he gets these scissors and you see his hand. Because don't forget the camera's on top of his helmet. So you see his hand with the scissors, but he doesn't do anything with them. Obviously, what in his mind is he wants to cut this line and get himself away because he would have been running out of air. You know, all of this stuff was going on. But he couldn't and his breathing starting to slow down. And, you know, you can only imagine his friends and the diving community who were watching this at the time. You, can't, you can only imagine how they would have felt hearing, you know, this colleague and this friend struggling and this very strong man you know who they all listened to and they all looked up to and he's losing his breath and slowly he's, he's he tries to walk towards where he would go up and he slows down and his breathing slows down and then he he just stops breathing and that's Dave Shaw died there. Oh, it's just so upsetting. Um, but 10 days later, after Dave and Dion were retrieved from the water, um, Dion's parents got to see Dion's body. As such. It didn't matter. It didn't matter to them what state Dion was in. I've said it you know, a few times it has been 10 years. They didn't care. I don't think I would. I wouldn't care. I would want just to be close to my child, no matter what, no matter what state they were in one last time, you know, and they've waited 10 long years. And it was said that the one thing they noticed that was still on Dion was this pair of underwear that they bought him, possibly for Christmas, um, and they recognised that underwear and it just kind of, it just helped them, I suppose, maybe. Um, and so then they could finally put him to rest. Um, and they'll obviously always be forever grateful to Dave that he brought their son home to them. Um, and there is a comment that Dave had made before the dive, or at some point, but it was a comment that I believe Dave made, and it, it was said that the safest thing a diver can do is not dive. And it's just so poignant. Um, and obviously going back to Dion at the barbecue, where he said, you know, if I was ever going to go, you know, I'd, uh, what did he say? If I have a choice of how to go out in life, I'd like to go out diving. You know, these... These words that are spoken are just so poignant, at, you know, when things like this happen. And it's just, it was just so sad, so selfless as well to go down. But like I say, when he, when Dave found Dion the first time in, in the October, he, it was said he felt such a connection with, with this young lad that he knew he was going to get him out and, he was true to his word. You know, it was just sad that he, you know, he's like, he lost his own life doing it. But, you know, Dave Shaw will go down in history now, you know, as someone who, who did that, you know, and re retrieved this young boy to allow Dion's parents to finally lay him to rest. And obviously Dave was laid to rest. And, you know, it's just, it was just such a sad, sad story, sad ending. But it kind of, it got me and all the, all the details about the, the dive itself. And, you know, just how dangerous it is. I mean, look what Dave says, you know, the, 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 the safest way. That, sorry, I want to make sure I get the word right. Um... The safest way to dive is not to dive at all. Yes, yeah, safest thing a diver can do is not to dive, you know, which says it all really. Um, yeah, I want to say I'm sorry if I've got any terms wrong, if I've got any 
um, of the place names wrong or, you know, pronounce them wrong, I have tried to look into it as much as I can. Um, but I just wanted to share that with you and I thought it was a little bit different uh, for my 100th story. Um, and yeah, that was the story of uh, Dave Shaw and Dion Dreyer um, and the horrifying Bushman's Hole. So thank you for joining me. Um, I really appreciate it. You know, if you'd like to subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. Or any comments, any stories you'd like me to look at. And yeah, I definitely recommend looking at Mr. Borland. He, he, he honestly is amazing. He's a really good storyteller. He's very, um, he, he does excellent research, you know. And um, yeah, I definitely recommend him. And, but I'd recommend myself as well. Please come back. I'd really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, just thank you to you all again. Take care and I'll see you soon. Thank you.